Good morning, um, everyone, um, and welcome um, to the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls event to mark the publication of our 2020 report and recommendations. My name is Louise MacDonald, and I am the co-chair of the Advisory Council alongside Dr. Una Jackson. And on behalf of both of us and the 17 other women and girls who make up our advisory council, I want to extend the warmest of welcomes to every one of you here today. I'm going to be your guide today alongside Kyra and Linda, who are our BSL interpreters for the day. They will be spotlit throughout um, this event, so they will, they will always be on screen. Now, some of you um, may have attended one of our in-person circle events in the past, and we're really missing the buzz and energy of those events. But sadly, we are still fighting this pandemic and continuing with the necessity of virtual events, quite rightly, to keep everybody safe. So we are profoundly grateful to see you all and for your time today. And we hope that you enjoy what we have to offer this morning and that it both energizes you and brings you some hope maybe about the art of the possible in these tough times. We're delighted that the First Minister will be joining us this morning and will give us her initial response to the 2020 report and recommendations in a few minutes. And I'd like to extend our thanks to the Minister for Older People and Equalities, Christina McKelvey, who is also with us this morning. So good morning, Minister. Some practicalities for today. I'm sure you're all very skilled at this by now, but please do mute your microphone um, if you can. And we are very happy if you want to sit either on or off camera. Um, we know lots of you will have caring responsibilities right now. So of course they take priority if you need to dial out to give support to those you love. But we are always happy to see wee faces popping up on screen to say hello. And we always love a surprise appearance from a pet. So please don't worry about any of that. Um, I hope you have your tea and coffee and a biscuit or several to hand. And if you do need to get up, stretch, have a wander while listening in, if you can, or you need to kind of move just to make sure you're comfortable, of course, go ahead and do that. Feel free to chat about the event today also on social media. In fact, we'd, we'd love you to do so. The hashtags are hashtag generation equal and hashtag NECWG. And you'll see reminders of these in the chat function as well as we go through the event um, in case you, you forget those. And we're recording the event also. We did advise people of that in advance so that we can share this with those who weren't able to attend this morning. Now, the Advisory Council continue to be so deeply grateful at the incredible support that has grown since our inaugural meeting in December 2017, all those years ago now, it does feel a long time. And whether this is your first circle event or not, the event today has lots for you to engage with and crucially offer your insight and advice on. Our 2020 report and recommendations was published yesterday and a link was circulated um, to all circle members. So I do hope you've at least had a chance to have a look at the recommendation summary and are ready to share what you or your organisation can do to help realise them during our Zoom Zoom discussion sessions later on this morning. But let me first of all set a little bit of context for today. The First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls was formed as a catalyst for change to address gender inequality by providing an independent voice to the First Minister. There has and continues to be outstanding work happening in Scotland on gender equality. And once again, and I say this at every session we have, a profound thanks to those women's organisations across Scotland for all the work that they do day in and day out. And especially during this pandemic, when the need for their vital work has never been more stark. The Advisory Council's vision for Scotland to be recognised as a leader for our commitment and action towards realising an equal society 
where all women and girls can reach their true potential and improving the lives of everyone in Scotland as a result. We want gender inequality to become a historical curiosity, nothing less. But we have now reached the end of our initial three year strategy. We have looked at attitudes and culture change, policy coherence, and in 2020, our topic has been creating an intersectional gender architecture, the status of women in Scotland, structures and intersectionality. And before we go any further, we do want to address the title of this report, which has generated lots of questions. In settling in to using the term intersectional gender architecture, our, our intent was not to obscure through language. In fact, it was quite the opposite. It was an attempt to be very specific with our language so that we, as a council, remained focused on the purpose of this third report, the systems, legislation, agencies and duties which should be advancing women's equality. Our journey as a council over the past three years has been moving continuously upstream each time, exploring the system which leads to policies being created and approved, which don't work for women and girls, which in turn contribute to creating the conditions for the attitudes and culture which blight their lives in a myriad of ways every day. So to ensure that we were precise and to bring a discipline to our thinking, this is how we described it. It was a helpful way of prompting us to ask ourselves and the circle the question, what is it in the heart of the system that needs to change to stop this, whatever this is? So it was about tracking back, going up river, trying to get the design specification right. But if that title on the front page is stopping people from engaging with the work, meaning that they are not willing to read the report, even with our description of this experience within it, then we need to consider that carefully as a council. We have always been open to learning and to listening with respect and good faith. So we will talk about this at our meeting as a council this afternoon. But in the meantime, we would invite everyone to read the report in full and engage with the substance of it and consider the difference those recommendations would make to the lives of everyone in Scotland. Now, the Advisory Council was not established to be a delivery body. We are an Advisory Council to the First Minister and our focus is on the systemic change required to end gender equality. So the how of, these report, of this report and recommendations is for government, parliament, public, private, third sector, all of us to collectively achieve as part of the national performance framework and Scotland's commitment to our wellbeing economy. And our three sets of recommendations were designed as a package, each year building on the others and we believe that that package, when taken forward, would make a significant contribution to the systemic shift that Scotland requires. We're finalising our 2020, we were, sorry, finalising our 2020 programme when the coronavirus pandemic hit. And like so many others, we had to switch to digital and over the summer produced information, podcasts and webinars and engaged with our circle virtually. We heard about our annual topic from so many different perspectives, representing the rich intersectional nature of all those committed to being part of positive change. And a huge thanks to all of our circle members, and I know many will be on this call today, who hosted their own wee circles online for this. We also held deep dive roundtable events with women's organisations, black women and women of colour, with businesses, and we also deepened our youth engagement program through an amazing online Zine project with a diverse group of young people from across Scotland. 
please do check out their work if you haven't done so already. The links are on the One Scotland page with our report. We considered all of this evidence, insight and digital engagement when considering the recommendations that you have before you now. And on that note, it's now time. I hope I need to check my screen to make sure that the First Minister has now joined us. But it is my pleasure and now to introduce the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, MSP, to give her initial reflections on her recommendations and outline her vision for what comes next. After we hear from the First Minister, we do have a little bit of time for some questions relating to the Advisory Council 2020 report specifically. So please do log these in the chat function and we will try to get through as, as many as we can in the time that we have available. First Minister, we're delighted to see you um, this morning and so grateful to you for joining us. And now the Zoom room is yours. Thanks very much, Louise, and hello to everybody watching. It's great to be with you for today's event. Uh, and let me say I'm really pleased that this event's been able to go ahead today in this format. Uh, when we last gathered together in January last year, I don't think any of us, uh, including me, could have even begun to imagine the year ahead that we had in store. So let me begin today by thanking the Council, the wider circle and everyone else for all of your efforts over the past year in what has been an extremely challenging time. I'm very grateful to all of you, uh, given the circumstances that you have been working under. You know, for 10 months now, COVID has quite literally transformed almost every aspect of our lives. And that's true for every single one of us. But we know that not everybody has been affected by the pandemic in the same ways or to the same extent. And as your latest report points out, COVID has both exposed and undoubtedly exacerbated so many of the inequalities that exist in our society. And that definitely includes gender inequality. And in doing that, it has also underlined why it is so important that we take urgent action to tackle these issues head on. In fact, the pandemic has reinforced the value of so many of the Council's earlier recommendations. For example, the Council has previously suggested improvements to the ways in which we support victims of sexual violence and domestic abuse. And there's no doubt at all that the pandemic has emphasised once again just how important that is. We know that women and girls who are subject to domestic abuse are far more likely right now to be feeling isolated and vulnerable, indeed to be isolated and vulnerable. And there are indications that domestic abuse may have risen over the course of the pandemic. That's why the Scottish Government has provided additional support for women's aid organisations, Rape Crisis Scotland and Scottish Women's Aid, for example. And it's also why we are continuing to take significant longer term action on the issue of violence against women. In November, we announced a new working group, which is led by a member of this council, Baroness Helena Kennedy, to consider the creation of a standalone criminal offence of misogyny in Scots law. And that stems very directly from a key proposal in your first year report. And then just last month, the Forensic Medical Services Act was passed unanimously in the Scottish Parliament. That legislation ensures that victims of rape and sexual assault are able to access forensic medical examination without first making a report to the police. And again, that fulfills some of your key recommendations. Of course, the Council's first year report also focused on the importance of childcare and better support for women in the labour market. And again, the pandemic has really brought these issues very powerfully to the fore. We know that the closure of schools and nurseries has had an impact on everyone, but a disproportionate impact on women who are so very often the main providers of childcare. So that's one of the reasons that the Scottish Government is continuing to work with local councils to deliver on the expansion of early learning and childcare. 
Uh, the expansion, unfortunately, had to be delayed a bit because of COVID, but I'm pleased to say it is now back on track to be delivered from August this year. It's also the case, of course, that many sectors with higher levels of female employment, retail and hospitality, for example, are amongst those that have been hardest hit by the pandemic and the restrictions that we've had to put in place. And as women generally earn less and are much more likely to be in part time or less secure employment, the impact of being furloughed or made unemployed is particularly acute. Now, support from government can mitigate some of that impact, whether that's through direct support to businesses or help for families, such as the continued provision of free school meals through the holiday periods. But we also need to take longer term action, which doesn't just mitigate the impact of inequality, but helps to address the root causes of persistent inequality. You know, the PD Products Act, which was passed late last year, is a specific, but I think really important example of that. Scotland is the first country in the world to legislate for universal free access to PD products. Uh, we're also taking a number of steps to support women in employment. In November, we announced a new programme to help women return to work following a career break. We're providing funding to organisations like TimeWise and Flexibility Works to better promote flexible working practices. And through the Workplace Equality Fund, we are continuing to support projects which will make it easier for underrepresented groups to enter the labour market and progress through it. And I'm able to confirm today another important measure. Following extensive consultation, a model for the Gender Beacon Collaborative, which was another of your first year recommendations, has now been agreed. The collaborative will be delivered in partnership with the organisation Close the Gap, and it will bring together organisations from the private, public and third sectors, as well as the Scottish Government. The members of the collaborative will work together and share best practice on tackling workplace inequality. And they'll also receive specific support, for example, in calculating their organisation's gender pay gap and in implementing policies that can help to close it. The Gender Beacon Collaborative will launch later this year, and I hope it will serve as an example to employers across the country on how they can make their own workplaces more equal. All of these measures I've spoken about so far are aimed at tackling specific inequalities. But the Scottish Government is also thinking very carefully, not simply about what decisions and policies we implement, but about how we make those decisions. Based on your recommendation, we've already established a Scottish Government Directorate for Equality, Inclusion and Human Rights. Its first director was appointed last month. And our latest programme for government also commits to an equality and human rights mainstreaming strategy. And that's intended to further embed equality it, at the very heart of our policy making process. And it will seek to ensure that more people are involved in the decisions that then affect them. Again, I think the pandemic has shown why that's so important for women and also for many other groups, including minority ethnic communities, older people and disabled people. One important benefit of involving people more in the decisions that affect them is that we, I hope, then become better at identifying intersectionalities. And it then should be easier to see how different types of inequality interact and compound each other. And that's an area where we know we need to do much better in future policy making. And that, of course, makes the Council's latest recommendations on tackling intersectional inequality so very timely. And I want to thank all of you for producing, again, such a thoughtful and ambitious report. We will respond formally to each proposal in due course. But as in previous years, I want today to give you just some of my immediate thoughts and reflections. I'm aware that your report contains recommendations for other bodies, such as the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And I think that recognises a key and very fundamental point that although the Scottish Government must take a lead, that's our responsibility, other bodies also have a responsibility for tackling these inequalities. 
But in relation to the recommendations that are directed at the Scottish Government, we obviously support your proposal that equality legislation should be fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament and we will continue to call and for that and build support for that. The Council has also proposed a change in relation to the budget process and I can say that we will consider that recommendation very carefully as we develop our new mainstreaming strategy. You've also highlighted the need for the public sector to get better at collecting and using intersectional data and I think that's really important. We're taking steps already in that direction. Last summer, for example, in the context of the pandemic, we established an expert reference group to look at the impact of COVID on certain minority ethnic communities. And in December, we published our first gender equality index that uses a range of different measures to assess our progress in tackling gender inequality. So getting the right data and then even more importantly, using that data properly is, in my view, absolutely essential. And again, as we take forward the new mainstreaming strategy, we will consider what more we can do. Now, I'm very conscious that when we talk about some of this year's recommendations, and I think I heard Louise reflecting on this as well as I joined you this morning, that sometimes these recommendations may sound quite technical or they can sound largely about process. But it's really important to remember that there's a very good reason for that, because process and technical issues really do matter. The ways in which we take decisions, and this is something I've come to understand better over my years in government, the ways in which we take decisions and the ways that we assess their impact have a very direct bearing on the quality of those decisions and by extension on people's lives. So we must make sure that these processes are as inclusive as possible and that they are firmly focused on the central aim of creating a more equal society. Uh, in a nutshell, if the processes that lead to decisions are not as inclusive as they need to be, it's highly unlikely that the decisions that come out of those processes will be inclusive either. So even though process matters sound technical and a bit abstract, let's not forget just how fundamentally important they are. Now, as I've set out today, COVID has in so many ways made the task of achieving a more inclusive country much harder. Inequalities which already existed have been made worse and the pandemic has caused harms that I think we will be dealing with as a country for some time to come. But the past year has also, I think, and I speak personally here uh, as well, helped to clarify certain things. It has shown us the values that matter most in our society, love, compassion, solidarity, caring for each other. And it has really underlined something that we knew, but again, it has clarified and underlined this, the need for urgent action, not to spend too much time talking about these things, but to get on and do the things that we know are necessary to build a fairer and a more equal country. And as we recover from this crisis, and I very much hope I can't unfortunately give you the precise dates right now, but I very much hope that uh, soon we will be in the phase of recovery from this crisis, having moved on from the acute phase that unfortunately we are still in right now. But as we go into that recovery phase, it is so important that all of us focus on how we bring about that kind of change we know is so important. And I know the work that all of you have done through this advisory council will be vital in helping us achieve that. In the past three years already, you have helped identify some of the major challenges facing women and girls in this country. But more importantly than that, you've put forward practical actions to help us address these challenges and help create a more equal society. I am so hugely grateful to all of you for your efforts. And I really look forward to hearing your proposals on how this work can be carried forward in the future, because there's no doubt at all that it needs to be carried forward in the future. But for now, I want to thank uh, in a very heartfelt way, the Advisory Council and the wider circle for all of the effort, passion and commitment that you have shown over the past three years. And please know that you have already made a hugely important and significant contribution 
to the cause of gender inequality in Scotland. And I so much look forward to working with all of you as we emerge from this pandemic and get on with that task of building a better, more equal society in the months and the years that lie ahead. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, First Minister, and thank you for um, those words and also for that um, announcement around the Gender Beacon Collaborative. We're delighted to hear that that is progressing. Now, I think you do still have a few minutes for questions. Is that yeah, okay? Um, okay, thank you. So we've had um, a couple. First um, one that came in was around accountability. Um, and in particular, this is from um, Kay Lee, um, who is talking about how do we um, ensure that or demonstrate that there is accountability, particularly when um, trust in institutional accountability is already um, bruised. Um, so her, her question was around accountability in the system. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you might expect me, I suppose, to answer that question from my own perspective as the, the person who in the country is, is most accountable for uh, the decisions we take. And, and that, to me, is really important that the, the, the accountability that we want to run through uh, every level and layer of the country around how we make decisions, what those decisions are, how we implement those decisions and how we assess their impact that that does start at the top of government. And, you know, we don't get these things right all of the time. But again, I said in Milton Remarks that the experience of the pandemic has, for me, clarified lots of things that I already knew, but underlined them as well and the importance of them. And the need to be very accountable and open um, about the decisions we are taking during this extraordinary period when the things we're asking people to do are unprecedented and impinge so directly on individual and collective freedoms and, and liberties. That's been really important. Um, so too has been the, the need and the ability to recognise when things are not going as we want them to, when we've made mistakes, when we've got things wrong. Now, I hope we're not living through times that are quite so extreme and unprecedented for very much longer. But I think some of what we've learned about the importance of accountability, the importance of being open about failings and mistakes and trying to learn from those as we get better in the future can help us embed that accountability in a greater sense as, as we move forward. You know, we're all fallible. We're all human beings with uh, strengths and failings. And sometimes, uh, in the world of politics and institutional power. Um, and I think perhaps this is a female perspective as well. Uh, people spend too long trying to pretend that we're not infallible, that mistakes are not made, that you know we get everything right all the time. And a lot of energy is wasted on that when actually we should just be a bit franker with each other about the challenges we face and what it takes to live up to and address these challenges. So, you know, that's a, maybe a, a bit of a, a long-winded way of saying I think we've still got to get a lot better at this but hopefully we can learn from what we've lived through in the past few months. Great thank you and we've got a question from Gemma from um, GDA which is she's asking around in um, language um, and talking about how we need to make sure that we're using um, inclusive language um, and that we need to kind of make sure that, that that's something that we're really thoughtful about. And I did touch on that also um, earlier as well. So um, your thoughts around, um, I suppose in some ways, learning that perhaps you have, have also done um, around that need for um, being mindful and thoughtful about um, inclusive language. Um, I'll try not to talk too long on this because it's something I could talk about for a, a long time. And, and I start from a a perspective of somebody who, since I was a wee girl, has been fascinated by the power of language. You know, one of my, you know, passions in life is is reading and reading fiction and understanding just how language can both be uh, one of the most powerful tools of of human connection, but also, if if used in certain ways, can put barriers in the way of of greater connection and understanding. So it's something I'm I'm really interested in, uh, and I'll say two things here. Um, that I hope don't sound contradictory, um, but perhaps try to build on that sense of language as an enabler, but also sometimes if we're not careful as an inhibitor and, and the need to try and strike the right balance. So firstly, uh, in direct response to Gemma, I think the importance of inclusive language 
can't be overstated. It is vital that we recognise that when we are talking about people, the people that are hearing us talk uh, take from the language we use often uh, or assume attitudes and prejudice, prejudices. And so if we want people to feel included and be included, then we cannot, through our language, speak in a way that has the opposite effect. So inclusive language and learning from uh, people with lived experience, whether that's of disability, of gender inequality, or uh, prejudice and discrimination in any way about how we use language to include is so really important. I suppose my word of caution about that, and again, I speak from some personal experience here, is that while we should uh, be very careful about that and always try to learn about that, I think we've got to be careful we don't make people so terrified of using the wrong language or using words that they they perhaps don't mean what other people take to mean from that, that, that we stifle debate. And I know as a politician, I'm always mindful of, of not making mistakes in the language I use that would then give people the wrong impression of what I mean. Um, and that's a good discipline because I think we should all think very carefully about the language we use, but let's not get that to the point where, where language then becomes a barrier because we're also terrified that we perhaps misuse language that we're scared to debate what lies behind uh, the words. And so I think there's always a really, really uh, fine balance to be struck there as we navigate the, the power and the beauty, but sometimes uh, the barriers that language can pose for us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, First Minister. Now we've got some questions and I'm aware of very aware of time. We've got quite a few kind of questions that are specific impacts on um, women during the pandemic in terms of um, those that have caring responsibilities um, and those that are unpaid carers, um, women who are um, graduating and students and also concerns around low income and so on. So there are kind of, and um, women, um, who, disabled women who have um, obviously had to shield and feel and, um, very isolated. So there's, there's a number of kind of questions relating to those. I'm trying my um, best to try and figure out a way to kind of wrap all of those to one so that everyone gets a sense of, of that. But I suppose just in terms of that very practical support to, um, to those um, um, directly affected by COVID, as you'd mentioned, there have been a, a number of support measures kind of put in place where would you direct those kind of colleagues to to maybe get some um more information or um would it be possible for your um, officials to perhaps respond to some of those questions that are more explicit direct? Uh, we will certainly respond to all of the questions that have been uh submitted on this and, and direct people uh, as best we can to where they can get help and information um this is, I, I think, one of the most important aspects of, of what we're living through. You know, at the outset of this, people like me, and, and this to some extent is still an important sentiment. We used to and, and still say, you know, we're all in it together. And, and to some extent, we are all in it together. We're all living through this pandemic. But we've got to be careful that that doesn't, and people like me have to be careful that that doesn't assume that everybody's experiences of this are the same. If you, like me, live in uh, a nice house with a garden, uh, if you've got you know secured employment i'm not sure a politician's employment is ever secure or should ever be secure but you know the general point i'm making that's a very different experience to somebody uh, who experienced lockdown in a tenement flat with three kids with no garden to to get outside in so and that's just a, a very shorthand way of demonstrating that this experience has not been the same for all of us and as i said in my opening remarks, no doubt COVID has created new inequalities, but I think more than anything, it has exacerbated the inequalities that were already there in our society. And there are many examples of that, but for women, um, that is undoubtedly true. If you think about all of the ways in which COVID has changed our lives, then you will see very clearly, without really having to think too deeply about it, that women are disproportionately affected. You know people working in the front line of health and social care that will have experienced very acute stress and anxiety, will have confronted death on a scale that they won't have done before in the day-to-day -day, uh, working lives that they have. Those workforces are disproportionately female. Schools being shut, so there's homeschooling and childcare disproportionately will fall on the shoulders of women. Caring for elder elderly relatives who might be shielding, needing to 
you know, go out to get them shopping or make sure they've been cared for in other ways. Again, disproportionately women. The sectors that have been at hardest hit in terms of restrictions and closure, uh, retail, hospitality, disproportionately women, and in some of those, of course, disproportionately younger people. And I think the impact on younger people generally uh, cutting across different backgrounds has been severe. So we've tried to direct our response, and that includes our financial response, in a way that takes account of that. But there's more we need to do, and not just in this phase of dealing with the pandemic, but as we come out of it and get into recovery, we must continue to understand those disproportionate impacts. And we must also recognise that we need to accelerate the, the things we're doing to tackle those inequalities, because they've been there a long time, and we've now really been left with no hiding place uh, in terms of the existence and the pernicious effect that those inequalities have at a time of crisis. So there's lots of uh, things that this pandemic is teaching us. The test for all of us will be do we learn those lessons and get on and respond to them with as much force as we need to. Thank you. And just to um, say to circle members that have logged um, questions in the chat bar, um, we will be gathering those together um, and we will um, come back with um, responses to those. I can appreciate um, just in terms of um, so many kind of issues that people are really passionate about. And um, so we will um, we will pull those together. I know, First Minister, you need to you need to now go. So our, our thanks to you for such a thoughtful initial response and for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing more from yourself. Also from Ms McKelvey, um, as Joint Minister, and the team in due course. Um, and we know that you have so many pressing issues every single day in terms of what we are facing right now. But your presence here today, I think, demonstrates to everyone how you hold um, gender equality as such a priority and your deep commitment to these issues. Um, and you, know, you are leading us through this pandemic with such compassion and integrity, and we are all grateful for it. So. Thank you, and thanks for thank joining you. us. Thank okay, thank you to the First Minister. Um, and yeah, just to say to everyone, we will we will pull all those um, um, questions together and we will get a response um, um, issued to the circle. So it's now time um, for us to start to um, explore in some detail uh, our 2020 recommendations. Um, and just to kind of get us started and allow us to kind of switch and um, switch into this kind of focus and um, we've got a short film uh, to show you and then when it finishes advisory council members and um, Regati Campbell and Satwat Raman are going to take you through the recommendations so first of all I think my job is to say roll VT or whatever you say in Zoom means. <laughs> The First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls started this year with our Circle event, launching the 2019 report and recommendations on policy coherence and gender equality. When the pandemic struck, we adapted our 2020 model by working online and with cross-sector collaboration, delivered an expansive program. This year's focus was on creating an intersectional gender architecture in Scotland, one which works for all women and girls, with a dedicated webpage to explore this with our circle. In web content and webinars, we heard from gender experts and practitioners from academia and global NGOs. Circle members engaged digitally and held virtual annual topic circles, informing this year's recommendations. This is the final report of our initial three-year strategy, which was designed as a package. Sets of recommendations building on each other to kickstart systemic change. But our work isn't done. With input from our circle, we're exploring next steps, because together, we are generation equal. Okay, Revity and Satwa, over to you. Thank you so much for that, Louise. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I'm Revity, and I will be delivering this session with Satwa, and I will cover this first slot before handing it over to her. So together we're going to walk through the recommendations within our 2020 report and help you to understand how we arrived at what we did this time. At the outset, we did wonder how the topic of creating an intersectional gender architecture would unfold. But you had resoundingly told us at our inaugural meeting in December of 2017 that there were issues with the gender architecture in Scotland and that this affected women and girls. So it was vital that we explored this issue. 
every year we have explored our topics through an intersectional lens. Intersectional just happens to be the title of our topic this year. And let's be clear by what we mean by gender architecture. This is the structures that we are designed, that are designed, sorry, to advance women's equalities and rights, such as ministries, regulators, equality laws, duties, etc. Remember, we focused on attitudes and cultural change in year one, policy coherence in year two, and now this. And all of these topics should be viewed as a set. As always, our focus was on systemic change. And we spent time working out our scope to tackle this annual topic, ensuring that we understood what we were working with and what we actually intended to do with that. We concentrated on exploring what needed to be changed in the system to ensure that the gender architecture had better outcomes for all women and girls. Now, because of coronavirus, we worked with all of you digitally to the majority of 2020, and we created a web page to post content to, and we asked all of the circle members questions on our annual topic. We delivered a series of webinars, and we asked you to take forward we circles within your organizations, if possible. And we also listened to you at specific roundtable events and delivered an online program for the younger voice to be heard. We have over 1,300 circle members and you had lots to say on this topic. As usual, we looked at all of this with the key themes of leadership, accountability, and creating conditions central to our thinking. We believe that what we are proposing will result in a stronger gender architecture with accountability at its core, and we could call and we would call on the public, third and private sectors to develop work on how they can complement and strengthen the impact of the ambitions within these recommendations. Now, before I hand over to start what, I just want to spend a couple of minutes to quickly cover the context that we've been working in when exploring this topic. The Advisory Council acknowledges that Kimberly Crenshaw's first writings on intersectionality, the focus was rightly on black women's lives and the intersection of racism and sexism. Since her writings in the, last, in the late 1980s, intersectionality has become known as an acknowledgement of multiple intersections across multiple inequalities. So whilst the Advisory Council is also using the definition of intersectionality across multiple discriminations, the focus on racism should never be lost or diluted. Crenshaw stood on the shoulders of decades of black women writing about their experiences. And we too stand on the shoulders of giants like Crenshaw when discussing and analyzing intersectionality. A truly intersectional approach does not give a higher status to any one inequality or experience of discrimination as it should not recreate hierarchies, but rather should attempt to see the equally destructive force of all discriminations. However, the advisory council by its very nature is putting its central focus on women and girls and the intersections of gender and sex alongside race, disability, sexuality, class, caring responsibilities, religion, age, and any other forms of discrimination. In order to prevent the replicating of these hierarchies within the work of, our, of the advisory council, and within all the crucial work where a necessary focus is given to a specific inequality, there is a duty to mitigate the privileges that may exist in having such a focus. In other words, taking proactive measures to prevent the focus being on those who are already benefiting the most from the status quo. The Advisory Council has attempted to do this by ensuring a wide and diverse range of voices were able to input into the development of our recommendations that expertise specifically on intersectionality was sought out and that all requests for research or support are delivered within an intersectional analysis. We are proud of the work we've done and the generous support of so many diverse groups, but we also have to acknowledge that there is so much more to do. We believe that the work done so far must be built on with further investment and dedicated time. The voices and experiences of those most often ignored must continue to be prioritized. Whilst there is a specific focus on intersectionality and intersectional gender architecture in this final work of the Advisory Council's initial three-year strategy, we have worked to ensure that intersectional analysis has been at the core of our work since day one. 
And when discussing attitude and cultural change in year one, it was, it was critical to take an intersectional approach which understood the overlapping and compounding inequalities faced by women in Scotland. We cannot tackle negative and discriminatory attitudes towards women if we do not also deliver this work in a way which understands and tackles the specific discriminations faced by Muslim women, by Black women, by LGBT women, older women and younger women, trans women, or by disabled women, just to name a few. In year two, we discuss policy, policy coherence, how policy is made in Scotland and how well it operates to improve women's lives. We cannot be successful in delivering coherent policy if it works in silos and does not understand the complex realities of all women's lives. With this year's focus on gender architecture, intersectional analysis of this requires a review of how the policy and decision-making architecture of Scotland works for women and how it can become fit for purpose for women, especially those experiencing multiple discriminations as a consequence of architecture, which is simply not working well enough for them, failing to improve their lives, or more accurately, not even designed for them in the first place. The idea of a gender architecture sounds technical and abstract, but like the systems that deliver us clean water and electricity, it is profoundly important to women's day-to-day -day lives. Women in Scotland can get a mortgage in their own right. They can breastfeed anywhere that suits them and their baby, seek remedy for sex discrimination at an employment tribunal and see how wide their employer's gender pay gap. This is all because of gender architecture. Gender architecture is the name for all of the machinery of the state that is supposed to advance women's equalities and rights. And this includes things like the anti-discrimination laws and human rights laws, like the Equality Act 2010 and Human Rights Act. Statutory requirements to pro proactively promote women's equality, like the public se sector equality duty that is a part of the Equality Act 2010. Distinct ministries or ministers for women or gender equality. Independent oversight bodies like the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Dedicated parliamentary committees like the Scottish Parliament's Equalities and Human Rights Committee and mechanisms like equality rapporteurs. Gender focal points in government departments and public bodies like the, thought, like the forthcoming center of expertise and equalities and human rights in the economy portfolio within the Scottish government. And finally, institutional gender budget analysis, which considers the differences between women's and men's lives and the needs in determining how to use the state's revenue raising, tax and spending powers. The elements of gender architecture support gender mainstreaming. This is the idea that women's equalities and rights should not only be about special projects, programs and services, but should be a part of everything that the public sector does. Since the 1970s, gender architecture in Scotland has become an equality architecture. Laws, equality bodies and regulators cover multi-characteristic equality rather than focusing on sex or race or disability or sexual orientation or age alone. Now, in theory, this seems like it should create a conducive context for taking an intersectional approach. But in practice, the detail of how these structures work has prevented a truly intersectional approach. I hope this has provided you some good context setting. I'm now gonna hand over to Satwa to discuss the 2020 recommendations in further detail. Thank you everyone and hello and thank you very much Revati for that. My name's Sadfat and as Revati stated I'm going to be talking about each of the five recommendations that we've made in our 2020 report. And the first one is, and I'm hoping it's going to come up on the slide, that we call for the Scottish Government to advocate for the full devolution of equality legislation and policy making to the Scottish Parliament. As you know, equality legislation isn't fully devolved. And you told us that if Scotland is serious about radically progressing gender equality, the Scottish Government must dedicate considerable effort to the devolution of equality. And considerable effort does not mean simply writing periodic letters to Westminster. 
you told us that equality legislation for Scotland needs to be within our control. The Advisory Council absolutely agrees with you. Full devolution would support the creation of a systemic intersectional gender architecture by placing the power to legislate and regulate around equality, including both anti-discrimination protections and the requirement to be more proactive and take steps that affirmatively advance equality within the Scottish Parliament. Moving on to our second one, and this is a whistle-stop tour for them. I do apologise. I do know there'll be more time in the circles for some considered discussion about them. But moving on to our second one, we call on the Scottish Government to integrate intersectional gender budget analysis into the Scottish budget process and to give this a statutory footing. This would support the creation of systemic intersectional gender architecture by ensuring that revenue raising and spending meets the needs of all groups of women and girls, and that the Scottish budget proactively advances equality between women and men and realises women's rights. Moving on to our third one, we call for an equality focused review body to be established in the Scottish Parliament that will provide an equality focused accountability mechanism, which has an independent authority to scrutinise and analyse the Parliament's business. Because when we're considering the architecture within a nation, accountability is integral and takes on a role which is beyond the implementation of a particular strategy or a specific law. Rather, it's the accountability of the governing structures themselves, beyond the colour of the government of the time. So to this end, our discussions led us to explore the parliamentary and decision-making system of Scotland. We recognise that to date the reliance has been on the Equality and Human Rights Committee of the Scottish Parliament to provide a critical eye and evidence base on equalities and human rights implications of bills, frameworks and strategies. The Equality and Human Rights Committee is not mandated or resourced to do all the equality work of the Scottish Parliament and as a consequence much of that legislative scrutiny and inquiry work that committees carry out do not include a comprehensive intersectional gendered approach. So we've therefore called for an equality focused review body to be established within the Scottish Parliament that will provide an equality focused accountability mechanism which has an independent authority to scrutinise and analyse Parliament's business. This includes proposed bills, amendments, committee inquiries and the Scottish budget, integrating equality processes and realising equality outcomes. This independent equality focused review body needs to be sufficiently resourced with competence built in and extra commissioned when needed to, to provide high quality research, evidence gathering and evaluate the impact of all proposals and debates being progressed through all committees. We believe this body should be complementary to the Equality and Human Rights Committee, raising the ambition of a parliament with equality and human rights at its core. This independent authority would be part of the parliamentary process with its role built into the progression of bills ahead of them being presented to Scottish Parliament to be voted on. It would provide much needed expertise and equality focused oversight of bills being pursued and committee activities to enable gender mainstreaming within the outputs of the Scottish Parliament and by extension the Scottish Government. As an independent council we've now formally written to the Scottish Parliament about this and we also called for them to carry out a rigorous gender audit of its processes and identify action to increase its own gender competence. We understand that this is quite a radical ask, but we firmly believe that it's one that will benefit all women and girls in Scotland, as it will support systemic intersectional gender architecture by scaling up the Scottish Parliament's competence and capacity to mainstream intersectional gender equality within its functions. Now I'm now going to move on to our fourth recommendation, where we call on the Scottish Government as part of the current review of the public sector equality duty regulations in Scotland to place additional specific duties listed on public bodies to gather and use intersectional data, including employment and service user, 
to advance equality between protected, uh, protected groups, including men and women. Integrate intersectional gender budget analysis into their budget setting processes and procedures. We note that work is already underway to review the PSED, but we, we believe this recommendation would support the creation of the systemic intersectional gender architecture by enhancing gender mainstreaming impact of the PSED with all public bodies in Scotland. We've also called on COSLA to consider its role in relation to this recommendation and how it might constructively facilitate deeper engagement across all spheres of government and local policy making relating to the scrutiny of ensuring that the rights of all women and girls in Scotland are realised. Local implementation and the necessary conditions are vital to deliver increased equality for diverse women, for example, disabled women and those in caring roles and in social care. A final recommendation to help reform the gender architecture in Scotland concerns the Scottish Human Rights Commission, the SHRC. We call on the SHRC to appoint a commissioner tasked specifically with promotion and protection of women's rights. This commissioner would lead work to realise rights for all women as set out in CEDAW, the, East, the Istanbul Convention and other international instruments. We also call for the expansion of the mandate of the Scottish Human Rights Commission with sufficient resourcing to allow it to take on cases on behalf of individuals. Beyond the SHRC, we also call on the Scottish Government to ensure that the mandates of all Scottish regulators, ombudspersons and oversight bodies are required to advance equality and rights. We also call on all public bodies and authorities covered by the PSED and Scotland specific duties under the Equality Act to consider their role in relation to this recommendation and how they can go further to champion and progress the rights of women and girls. Achieving equality for diverse women and girls is a collective responsibility and it's essential to the success of every public body. We believe this recommendation would support the creation of a systemic intersectional gender architecture because it would build into the legal scrutiny mechanism in Scotland a clear understanding and framework for budget scrutiny and analysis, including decisions on how the money is spent. So in conclusion, based on our engagement with you all over 2020, this is what we've arrived at five recommendations that we believe will help strengthen the gender architecture in Scotland. Again, we want to stress how these recommendations link to our previous recommendations. Our initial three year strategy was designed as a package to help kickstart systemic change to help progress gender equality in Scotland. We are excited, very excited about the outcomes of what was an incredibly challenging year for each and every single one of us. So thank you all so much for your insight, the perseverance and the courage. It truly has been a collective endeavor. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. And I'm now going to hand back to Louise. Thank you so much to Sakvat and to Revity for taking us through those recommendations, um, which um, we're going to be inviting you to um, reflect on in our discussion sessions shortly. So before we now move into our discussion groups, I just want to say a couple of words about the next steps for the Advisory Council. We'd mentioned earlier that we were set up as an independent voice to the First Minister established in 2017. And we engaged with the circle at that point about what we should focus on um, in Scotland. It should be stressed that we were acutely aware of the really fantastic work that was being taken forward by so many organisations in Scotland. And um, as we mentioned before, standing on the shoulders of giants. So we were very clear that we wanted to not duplicate. We wanted to add value and that in particular, we wanted to focus on that systemic um, piece. What could we do um, around that? to really kind of move us upstream. So we've now had our three reports. You've heard the First Minister's initial reactions to our, our uh, latest one, but we really do believe that all three reports should be seen as a, as a set 
and that if they are taken forward as intended with drive and collective commitment, then that will kickstart that systemic change. Now, those recommendations are bold and they are complex, and some of them will take time to develop, but also to implement well. So as we've heard, some of the recommendations we proposed in 2019 are now thought through and moving to implementation. There's lots of planning and scoping required for these things, and we must also recognise that in 2020, everyone was dealing with the immediate and overwhelming cross-sector response required to mitigate the pandemic. But we are seeing movement. The seeds sown are emerging strongly. Spring is coming. We've held two accountability days um, with um, representatives from Scottish Government to check in on progress. And again, as mentioned, one of our 2019 recommendations to upgrade the equality unit in the Scottish Government to a directorate in its own right was moving fast. And we were delighted when Madhu Malhotra started in post as the new director last December. Madhu has been with us today and has already had meetings relating to the work of the Council. So things are being hardwired in place so that our recommendations can provide that catalyzing force. But the job is not done. As I've said, this, these recommendations take time. And we also need to look carefully at how we can mitigate the policy implementation gap, that space where so many things fall. And like everyone on this call, we all want to change that gap. So we believe that engagement with you is also incredibly important. Um, that was a vital part of our kind of three year strategy was that insight from you. And so in terms of our kind of next steps, we are thinking about how the, the sort of next steps of the advisory council could and should include a model and function for accountability and scrutiny. And that also that that new um, um, next iteration, if you like, of the council should continue to connect support with all of you as a circle. We've learned so much over the past three years from each of you, and thank you for being part of that learning. So we will be submitting our thoughts to the First Minister very soon. You heard from her how keen she is to hear those ideas. We gathered some ideas from you in our survey before Christmas. But now we're going to give you another opportunity to do that. So we're now going to go into um, breakout rooms, um, Zoom rooms. Um, each breakout room will have a facilitator. And we're asking you to explore two questions. What will you do? And this is about you, your network, the organization that you're kind of connected to. What does it think that you can contribute in terms of our latest recommendations? So the recommendations that we have made in this report, what is it that you think you and your networks and your organisation can do? And also, what do you think the Advisory Council should do next? But please focus on system change and scrutiny. The main points from the discussion will be recorded by your facilitator and shared with the Advisory and Council. Um, and I want to remind everybody that these discussion spaces are safe spaces. Thank you so much um, for that and welcome back. And thanks for your input and to our facilitators. Thank you um, for helping with that. And all of the, those um, discussion points will be um, pulled together um, and considered by the Advisory Council in terms of our thinking. Um, around next steps for the Advisory Council to the First Minister. Now, obviously, it's up to the First Minister to decide what she, what she wants to do with her Advisory Council and the incoming First Minister after the May elections to decide what comes next. But we will keep you informed and we will also be in regular contact with you as Circle members as we transition into um, whatever comes next. So to do our formal close um, of this, our kind of final circle session uh, of this um, three-year plan, I'm now going to hand over to Katie, Amina and Reviti, our youngest council members, who are going to close proceedings today. 
So Katie, I think, am I starting with you? Off you go. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Katie and along with advisory council members Amina and Reviti, we will be closing today's event. We'd like to start by adding our thank you to each of you for making the time to join us today. Your support is really appreciated. A huge thank you also to all of our speakers and to the wonderful Purple Poncho players. I thought they were really fab. We hope today has been helpful for you and that our 2020 report and recommendations has done what you shared with us justice. Even though this year has had its challenges, you've been generous in sharing your insight and experience and we hear you loud and clear that the appetite for change is very much alive. This pandemic has exposed all too clearly for all to see the impact of structural gender inequality. Our view as an advisory council is that gender equality in Scotland will be achieved through systemic change and that change needs to be a story of agency and hope. We absolutely believe that gender equality is possible in Scotland through our common endeavour. It is up to all of us to set the expectation that we can do this and create a movement that understands clearly and gains to be the <laughs> understands clearly the gains to be made from gender equality and demands change for the greater good. So thanks to each and every one of you and the over 1300 members who have signed up to the circle so far. Thank you for your ideas, your insight, your expertise, your curiosity and your commitment. Thanks for traveling alongside us and helping us to get to this point. As our co-chair Louise mentioned earlier, following this event, we'll be concentrating on finalizing our suggested next steps plan for the advisory council. Thank you for everything that you submitted via our annual survey and for the extra information supplied at the breakout sessions. All of this will be considered. We'll be submitting our next steps plan to the first minister as soon as we can, and we will keep the circle updated with plans as they develop. We are really excited about the next stage and what they bring. Until we meet again, please continue to engage with our spotlight topics. The next focus is women and employment post COVID. You can set up a spotlight we circle with work colleagues, with your families and with friends when you can and share those outputs with us too. Our thanks again to the First Minister and Purple Poncho players and all our wonderful volunteer facilitators. Your input, or your input over these first three years has been extremely important and we're so grateful for your commitment to the Advisory Council circle. And thank you to all our wonderful Advisory Council colleagues. I'm personally so inspired by all of you and I've learned so much from you and I'm really excited to see what comes next. Things are pretty tough right now, as we all know, and I'm so, some of the predictions around the impact of the pandemic on gender inequality for years to come make for grim reading. But out of situations like this come possibility, the chance to challenge, the chance to change, and the chance to come together to make things better. As young women in Scotland, we will play our part. And we need each of you, plus those you bring to the cause, to stand with us. Together, we are generation equal. Thank you so much for coming to our circle today. Thank you so much. And please do the use the reactions button um, to that too. So thank you so much, everybody. That concludes the session today. Um, and a reminder that the, um, the questions that were submitted today will be put, pulled, pulled together and put forward. Um, and we will be coming back with responses to those. Please take good care, everyone, um, and remain involved in the Advisory Council on Women and Girls for now online. But yes, there is much, much more to do. So we need to do that together. Thank you, everyone. And Advisory Council members, our session starts at 1 p.m. this afternoon. So we shall see you then. To everyone else, take good care. Thank you. Bye bye.